Hello everyone, we're getting ready to look up today with a brand new Uplook video with a new top 10 list. You can like the video, subscribe, and ring the bell to make sure you don't miss out on any of our future videos. Today, we'll survey 10 periods of Old Testament history. If you are visiting London or Toronto or New York for the first time, it would be great if a friend familiar to that city could give you some basic landmarks so you could find your way around. That way, you could enjoy exploring without getting hopelessly lost. That's the point of this video. Some tour guides to the greatest stories ever told. So, here's number one. Our first period of Old Testament history is Edenic. Right, Eden, the name of paradise that God created for man, means pleasure. So it's a bit of a clue that God created us for pleasure. And as long as it was in the bounds that God gave. So this period is covered by Genesis chapters 1 through 3, tells the story of the creation of the universe, and then the special creation of Adam and Eve from pre-existing material, God breathes into them the breath of life, and they become living souls. Then we have the institution of marriage. We have the first covenant. God gives responsibilities to man, the temptation and the fall, and then the curse and the expulsion from Eden, but the promise that God is going to send his deliverer. Imagine at the very moment when these creatures had brought the whole thing crashing down, that God was prepared to tell them that he was going to send the seed of the woman eventually to deliver them. Then number two, the primeval, which means earliest age. Right. Chapters 4 to 11, we see right away the crisis that develops, the story of Cain and Abel. And over in the little book of Jude, we have Cain described, woe to those who have gone in the way of Cain. And we read that, they're like raging waves of the sea, foaming up their own shame, wandering stars for whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. So right at the beginning, we see those who go Cain's way and those who go God's way, which is the way that Abel went. And that decision follows all the way through Scripture, these two choices for and against God. Then we go on to the stories of Seth, who replaces Abel in the Messianic line all the way to Enoch and the story of Methuselah, the man who lived the longest. And why? Well, he's an expression of the long-suffering grace of God because his name means something like when he dies it will be sent. And when he died the flood came. And so we have the story of Noah and the flood and then the Tower of Babel. And again, this consolidation of the human race in an attempt to be satisfied without God. And we have the enumerating and the dispersion of the nations and the three branches or families of nations that come from the three sons of Noah. And there are two great lessons in this section. The length of God's grace manifested and then the drastic surgery that God takes in order to rescue the human race. We might think of the flood as a terrible judgment, but God was looking for anyone that he could salvage out of this so that he could continue this story of God's love and grace towards the human race. Then we have number three, patriarchal. From Genesis 12 through 50, we have the focus now that God places on Abram. He takes Abram out of Ur of the Chaldees and he begins to work through this man. And what's remarkable, of course, is that we have just these first few chapters on the creation of the universe and then we have all the rest of the Old Testament talking about this man and his family and the nation that came from his family. And so he leaves Ur, he delays in Haran, eventually moves to the land of Canaan. We have the story of Isaac and then his son Jacob and then his son Joseph and his brothers, which is the focus. The family goes down to Egypt, the land of Goshen. And again, we have two great lessons here. Abraham and the call of Abraham and why God says, I know he'll 
instruct his children after him. I'm looking for a missionary family that's going to take the message of the true God because people had degenerated into polytheism and pantheism and God wanted the world to know that the universe is not run by impersonal force working on mindless matter, that there's a personal God behind the universe who wants a personal relationship with us. And the other great idea that we have, of course, is that ultimately God is going to work through Joseph in rescuing the human race and had sent him before as a kind of savior. And ultimately this would lead to the true savior, Christ himself. Then transitioning just from the family into the nation, we have number four, bondage in Egypt. Right, covered by the first 12 chapters of Exodus, we have a Pharaoh that doesn't know Joseph, that takes the children of Israel and puts them into slavery, and then the rising up of Moses. We have Moses' ancestry, capital A, in chapter one, and then we have his birth in chapter two, and then we have his call, in chapter 3. And then as the story develops, Moses brings these plagues on Egypt and the tenth, which is an expression again of God in wrath, remembering mercy. He provides a salvation through the Passover lamb and we have the children of Israel being taken out of Egypt through the exodus, the crossing of the Red Sea and the destruction of the enemy. Then number five, the wilderness wanderings. This chapter begins, of course, with the story of the Exodus, and we have the being delivered in Egypt by the power of the blood, and then being delivered out of Egypt by God's mighty arm and opening up the Red Sea. This idea that we're saved not by blood only, but by water and by blood, saved from this world and then saved out of it, through the redemptive power of the Lord. So the children of Israel are supposed to make a very short journey across the Sinai Desert until they come to the Promised Land. But they doubt the Word of God, they insist on these spies going in, the spies come back and say, yes, what God has said is true, however, there are the great and walled cities, there are these giants, and we can't finish them off, so it would be better if we died in the desert. And God said, I can arrange it. And we have this sad story for 38 years. Two years, they're parked at Sinai. And then for 38 years, they wander until that whole generation dies off in the wilderness. And it's such a sad story. The Sinai covenant is given during this time. And the tabernacle is reared. And God once again reminds he wants his people to draw near to him. But there is an appropriate way to do that. And... We have the deaths of Aaron and Moses, and then Joshua takes up the leadership of the children of Israel on the plains of Moab overlooking the Promised Land. Then number six, the conquest of Canaan. The conquest of Canaan, covered by the book of Joshua, and it deals with the crossing of the Jordan River and the three campaigns, the Beachhead Campaign, where they take Jericho, the largest oasis in the world, because the water from the rock has stopped, the manna has stopped, they have fresh fruits and vegetables and water taking the city of Jericho, and then first of all the failure at Ai, and then the recovery, and then the battle with the five kings of the south in the Valley of Ajalon, where the sun stood still. And then we have the move to the north, the battles at the waters of Merom, the northern confederacy defeated. Following with that, we have the dividing of the land, the 12 tribes, and Joshua's final charge to his people. Then number seven, the times of the judges. Right, the book of Judges and the little book of Ruth cover this period of time. There were 14 judges or saviors or deliverers that raised up, were raised up by God. Now, they are regional. They're not national leaders so much. They're regional. There's no king in Israel. And the sad word is everyone did what was right in his own eyes. So there's this sad downward cycle where the people forget the Lord. They get into idolatry. They're put in bondage to some enemy, the Midianites or the Philistines or whoever it is that comes in and 
causes them distress. Finally, sometimes after many years, they call on the Lord, he raises up a deliverer, and usually during the life of that deliverer, they remain true to the Lord. When the deliverer dies, they slip off again into idolatry and the whole sad process begins again. The book of the Judges gives us strategies for personal victory. Just as the book of Joshua gives us strategies for corporate victory, this one tells us how we can still be overcomers in the midst of declension and doubt. The people were far from God and yet we see individually these men and women of God who look to the Lord and who live victorious lives in spite of it. So we need devotion as well as the deliverer. In other words, it's not enough for the Lord Jesus to be committed to the cause of God. We need to be committed too if we're going to live on the victory side. Then number eight, we have the monarchy. So this is a lengthy section in the heart of the Old Testament. It covers 1st and 2nd Samuel, 1st and 2nd Kings, 1st and 2nd Chronicles, as well as quite a few of the prophets. Written during the times of Isaiah and Jeremiah, Lamentations, Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, and Zephaniah. So we have really three sections. We have the United Kingdom, 40 years each for Saul, David, and Solomon. Then we have the divided kingdom when the ten tribes from the north follow Jeroboam and the two tribes in the south stay with Rehoboam, the foolish son of Solomon. In the north, there are 19 kings, all bad. They're all pretenders to the throne. In Judah, there are maybe five or six that are thought of as being good kings. Now, one of the encouraging things we see during this time is the ministry of Elijah and Elisha who, in spite of the fact that the people have wandered from the Lord, God still keeps speaking in grace, manifesting his power, and we see there that God rejects man-made divisions. When Elijah builds this altar on Carmel, there are 12 stones for the 12 sons of Jacob. God still sees his people as united in spite of man-made divisions. And that's certainly true today. He still sees one body of all true believers. But we discover this principle that there will be only one king priest who will truly unite everything in himself. Every attempt at that was a failure, even with the best of men. And God is still looking forward to his deliverer who will unite the monarchy with the priesthood, a king priest, a priest on a throne. And of course, that's our Lord Jesus. And then number nine, the exile in Mesopotamia. So this actually produces the third subdivision of the monarchy because after the united section and the divided section, then we have a period of solo time when only Judah exists because the Assyrians rise up, they come down and take Israel off into Mesopotamia. And then some years later, we have the rise of Babylon and they come down and they take Judah into captivity. And so during this time, this is covered by the book of Esther, Ezekiel and Daniel cover this period. And we see again this idea, God doesn't have two sets of rules. And the fact that the children of Israel are probably more idolatrous than the Canaanites were because each nation of Canaan had their own set of gods but the Israelites seem to adopt all the gods of all the nations. And God said, if you're going to be idolatrous, I might as well take you back where I found you. And so right back to the land where Abraham had been taken out of idolatry, the children of Israel ended up back there. And they're there, as the scripture says, for 70 years. Eventually, Daniel reads in the book of Jeremiah, calculates the 70 years are up. He has a serious prayer time with the Lord and God moves a pagan king to instruct the people to go back and rebuild Jerusalem. And so uh, this period of exile uh, ends with Daniel's prophecies concerning the future and the move to restore the children of Israel to their land. And this is our last one, number 10, the remnants return. 
covered by the little book of Ezra and Nehemiah, and then the last three of the prophets, Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi. They left in three waves, taken into captivity, and they return in three waves. First of all, under Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, he would have been the high priest if there had been a temple at that point, in 538. And then Ezra, he comes back because the people had rebuilt the temple, but they didn't know how to use it. Well, Ezra is an expert in the law, and so he came back in 547, and he instructed the people how to use it. And then Nehemiah, sometime later, who's still the king's cupbearer, he's in charge of palace security, and he hears that the walls are still broken down and the gates are burned, the enemy can come and go as he wants. And so he's moved to return and to rebuild the walls. And in 52 days, the people gather together, they rebuild the wall, set up the gates, that's in 444 BC. And so there are these three waves of return to the land. And this is all absolutely essential because they're setting the stage for the coming of Messiah. Jerusalem has to be ready for him. And so God never gives up on his people and he never changes in his ultimate program. God keeps working. Men fail, but God doesn't fail. He overrides man's failures and he still accomplishes his purpose. Now, of course, Malachi ends, and then we have almost 400 years of silence until the birth of Messiah, the beginning of Matthew. And it's during these 400 silent years we see the translation of the Old Testament into Greek, the Septuagint. We see the rise of the various sects of the Jews, like the Herodians and the Pharisees and the Sadducees and so on. We see the development of the synagogue system where they didn't have a temple to come to and so they had these synagogues which were not temples but where they came to discuss the law, discuss the Bible and so on and uh, to gather socially as Jewish people. And so these 400 years are important although God doesn't speak a word after Malachi until he speaks in his son and that covers the end of the Old Testament for us. So as we, as we think about the Old Testament scriptures, we can't really understand the new if we don't have a grasp of the old because so much of the old keeps showing up in the new. So God help us as we look through these books, get a bit of a timeline, understand the flow of history, and look for the major themes in the Old Testament, which are the revelation of the person of God, the revelation of the plan of God, the revelation of the people of God, and the revelation of the provision of God. God's a giver God, gives in creation, gives in providence, gives in redemption. And if we're looking for these themes, we'll see them all through the Old Testament, interwoven, preparing for the glorious moment when God who spoke at different times in different ways finally spoke to us in the person of his Son.